You know, we all have those interesting periods in life where everything happens all at once. For me, that was October 8th through 10th, where in a period of 72 hours, I ended up helping set up a bunch of vintage PCs, which then led to the opportunity to explore an unusual copy of Windows 1.0. If that wasn't enough, during the same weekend, I also got to meet up with a few other YouTubers, including Sean of Action Retro fame, followed by then helping archive the firmware from a prototype iMac G5, before spending a bit of time exploring the AT&T Unix PC. That was then topped off with exploring an HP mini computer, and then looking at some of the stranger sights and sounds that were on display. For those who are wondering just what I was up to, this was the weekend-long meetup of VCF East hosted in Wall, New Jersey, where I exhibited my compact portable with my friend and co-exhibitor, Cyrusel. What had been planned as a relatively simple weekend ultimately ended up being a wild adventure, so we're going to do something a bit different. This is going to be more of an anthology of various retro computing topics, which I hope encapsulates the VCF experience with a side of my own commentary. I'll provide chapter marks for those interested in a specific topic. As always, this is your host and commander, and for the first time ever on this channel, we need to go outside. Anyway, if you haven't attended a Vintage Computer Federation event before, the best way I can describe it is that a bunch of people stand around and take bets on what machine releases the magic smoke first. This is usually followed by light conversation on a variety of retro computing topics and the occasional bad idea. For example, there was a YOLO smoke test performed on a Macintosh SC that was left exposed to the elements. I, I heard high voltage. Uh, oh my. Oh what the hell? We got no sad Mac. Your video is messed up. We got Raster. Honestly, I'm amazed that nothing exploded, but the flyback transistor was making some serious noise. I was hoping it would be bad I'm going to turn it off. All right. In short, it's a great way for any enthusiast to kill a weekend. I'd even go as far as to say that it makes a brief visit to New Jersey tolerable. I had attended VCF events before, but given that this year's theme was around the legacy of the IBM PC, I felt that the compact portable that I had been working on would be a great fit. As such, I applied to be an exhibitor and was accepted, and well, life happened. While I did some work on the portable, it mostly sat on my workbench gathering dust. Two weeks before the conference, I finally had the machine sorted and ready to go, which was just in time for the PSU I was using to die. <sighs> it's never easy, is it? I didn't record a lot of footage of the chaotic repairs that followed, but my tweets from this time can probably be described as barely contained panic. I did get everything worked out, and I even had a chance to install some upgrades, which of course didn't work. After some microchip surgery, I finally had an exhibit I could be proud of. Now we just had to get it to VCF. Since I don't own a car, Cyrusel volunteered to pick me up and drive us down. Traffic was light, and we made good time on the 60 mile or 100 kilometer drive down the Jersey Shore. One thing of note is that Friday is exclusively dedicated as a setup day, so we didn't have to get there as early as we did, although it ended up being a major blessing in disguise. It wasn't too long before we were pulling up on the InfoAge Museum where the event was hosted. After getting our badges, it was time to unpack. Now, if we were here with any other type of computer, there would probably be a setup montage of some sort. However, this is a compact portable. Setup is literally a matter of plugging it in. With that arduous task complete, I ended up spending quite a bit of time helping get some of the other machines working. As it turned out, many of the machines on display needed some work or at least some software to run. For instance, this XT286 had a dead battery and needed to run its diagnostics disk so it could boot up. 
Likewise, the hard drive on this AT&T PC decided that it needed an emergency spin right session. Since both floppy drives in the compact portable work and I had an XT IDE, I quickly got to work writing the necessary boot disks and helped sort out as many of the machines as I could manage. Working with both the staff and other exhibitors, we figured out what we wanted to run on various machines. For instance, we ended up running Adventure on this IBM 5155. One of the things we wanted to do was run OS2 on a PS2, but all three IBM PS2 machines we had on display decided to quit. Remember that part where I said we took bets? While the PS2s spent some time on the bench of healing, there was a working PS1 system which just barely met the requirement for OS2 2.1. This led to cracking the shrink wrap on a still sealed copy, followed by doing a lot of disk swapping to install. I won't go into the details on the install process since I've got literal live streams of doing this uncut, but let's just say it was a lot of effort to get a barely usable system up and running. Or, in other words, it was a period correct example of what using OS2 was like for most users in the early 90s. You know, I think the comment section is going to make me pay for that joke. Still, it didn't take too long until we had most of the machines sorted. It was at this point that I learned that I can cause cursed computing to happen without actively trying. While we were sorting the machines, I was asked to make a boot disk for another machine. At the time, I was half asleep and I mistakenly handed over the wrong disk, which led to this abomination. If your eyes are telling you that's an Apple II GS running Microsoft Flight Simulator, then I'm here to tell you that you are seeing this correctly. In addition to a large number of PCs, a lot of people brought machines that would emulate a PC in some way. For instance, this rather confused Apple Lisa is pretending to be a Macintosh, which in turn is running Insignia's soft PC to run DAWs. Even with the 6030 accelerator board, I'm pretty sure that this can be described as a glacier experience. Stepping back to that Apple II GS, it's got an add-on known as a PC transporter, which is essentially an IBM PC on an expansion board. I think past me summed it up pretty well. This should not work with the This is just wrong. Because you remember that the, the flight simulator was one of the is it actually simulating? Yeah, it was the, yeah, the limit the test. It was oh my god, it's moving! It was one of the bell weathers of PC compatibility back in the day. However, for every PC transporter, you have much less capable add-ons. This, for instance, is a RANA 8086 plugged into an Apple IIe. This sorry excuse for a PC compatibility solution struggles to run DAWs and crashes if anything uses the PC speaker. We're not entirely sure if that's a factory bug or one it's developed over the last 30 or so years. Still, it's not the greatest showing, but an amusing one nonetheless. That being said, I did manage to get it to partially boot my patched copy of the 8088 Unix known as Venix. It crashed right after start because of that PC speaker bug, but it did start so I'm going to say that this is an Apple IIe that has run Unix. As day became night, I felt that as a group, we were steadily winning the battle towards having these machines ready for public display, but there were definitely some casualties. For instance, this Commodore PC would start, but its disk drive decided that it didn't like floppies anymore. As for this XT, well, it just stopped posting. Still, on the whole, we were fixing them faster than they were failing, so when we closed up for the night, I felt that we were going to have a solid showing. The next day, with all the setup done, Cirisol and I took turns at manning the desk while checking the other exhibits. As we switched places, I spent some time going up to the main exhibit hall where I met Sean of Action Retro fame. If you don't know Action Retro, the best way to describe his channel is a large number of videos involving cursed Max. That's really the best way to sum it up, and of course, he had his collection out today, including the cursed SE30 
and a power computing Mac clone running Mac OS X 10.4. All of his machines were attached to a MUD running AUX and it was basically a love letter to all things Apple. We had talked for a while and then I had wandered off, not realizing that I had missed something important. As it turns out, Action Retro was sharing a table with two other YouTubers, the first being Mac84, who unfortunately I didn't get to talk to for very long. The second though was Mike's Mac Shack, who had a rather unique prototype iMac G5. If we turn the machine around to the back, we can see here that there's an integrated compact flash slot, and yes, it does work. From what Mike told me, apparently production iMac G5s have the CF slot pads on their motherboards, but they're non-functional. If we could dump the system firmware, it might allow for enabling the CF slot on production machines, and it would be a victory for preservation overall. Cyrusel had noticed this while I was at the desk and had recruited me into figuring out how to dump the firmware from Mike's prototype. Before getting me, Cyrusel had already figured out how to get a hex dump, while I figured out the mystical ruins necessary to redirect open firmware to Sean's power computing tower. In the end, we managed to start archiving said firmware by using Telnet and Screen. Unfortunately, I'm not certain if we got a good dump or not. For one, open firmware runs very slowly over Telnet, and we didn't get a direct binary dump. Secondly, the power computing Mac that I was using decided to go belly up not long after. I know Action Retro has gone this going again, but there wasn't enough time to check if I had gotten a good dump or not. I'll follow this up off camera, and hopefully we'll have some good news about preserving this unique artifact. I highly recommend you check out these channels for good Mac content. There will be links in the description to all three. Moving on, I have to admit that during the day, I couldn't help but feel like our exhibit was missing something. I had loaded up quite a few demo applications, but I felt like they didn't really stand out on the small green screen display that we had. It was though at this moment that a mutual friend showed up at BCF with a very large flight case. In it was the same type of Super 8 mini display that Gravis recently showed on his channel, Cathoid Ray Dude, and with it, we can show proper compositing CGA. I got to be honest, I didn't expect this at all, but it's really awesome to see, and it demonstrates how events like this can let us reach grounds that we'd never be able to get to on our own. I only wish I was able to find a sound blaster of some sort to be able to properly play 8088 Corruption and 8088 Domination, as full motion video on a 4.77 MHz processor is, quite frankly, an insane programming feat. That being said, it wasn't all work and no fun. I also spent a bit of time checking out consignment and the vendor sales areas. Pretty much any convention is going to have areas like this. From what I've heard, quite a few machines passed through here, including some SGI Indigos, Sun Ultra 10s, and much more. If you're lucky, you can find some incredible deals without the usual online markup. Earlier in the show, Sirisaw had managed to find a some work required Atari 800, and well, I had found a rather awesome machine that I'll show at the end, but at the vendor sales area, I had found something rather unique. As 5pm rolled around, things started winding down and the staff and volunteers were left to socialize in the main hall. This gave me the perfect opportunity to shoot a quick unboxing. In a $5 goods pile, I found a branded copy of Windows 1.0 complete with its manual. That in and of itself is already quite rare, but what made them unique is that this version of Windows was not intended for use on a PC. Instead, it was a special version meant for a Zenith Z100, which was an early 8088-based microcomputer. In fact, the Z100 even had an 8085, so it could run the 8-bit versions of CPM, although I didn't know that at the time. As it so happened, there was a Zenith Z100 at the show, so I had a rare opportunity to demonstrate Windows running on non-PC hardware, and it presented a second opportunity. There has been no proper dump of Windows for the Zenith Z100. The only archive that is known to exist is just a copy of the files and, to my knowledge, was entirely untested. 
having the original media on hand meant that another early version of Windows could be preserved. However, there was a problem. The disks were not readable. I tried on both my Compact Portable and Resident Disk Master Ian Primus also tried on his dedicated disk dumping rig. As it turned out, the disks were shedding and had some mold that had not been evident at first glance. Ian has a lot of experience with both hardware repair and disk preservation, and he's relatively close in real life, so I gave him the disks in the hope they will be preserved. Even a partial image would be a win since we could probably reconstruct any lost sectors. With luck, we'll be able to add another early version of Windows to the saved pile. I'm in contact with Ian and his Twitter is in the description if you want to follow him. That being said, I wasn't going to pass up this opportunity to explore Windows on a non-PC machine. Ian, who also owned the Z100 and a few of the other machines I've shown, such as the Rana Box, gave his blessing to try and do the installation. Using the file dump, I wrote out all five disks to fresh floppies and then got to work. As this Z100 doesn't have a hard disk, we'll be doing a floppy-based installation. On the whole, the installation isn't much different than the PC versions, although the nice IBM extended character graphics are notably missing. After doing all the necessary disk swapping, it's not too long before we're brought to the Windows splash screen and DAWs executive. On the whole, there weren't any major differences in the built-in applications with two major exceptions. First, the Zenith Z100 had a much higher resolution and graphics capability, which we can see by running the palette application. Secondly, it appears that the right application was not included in the non-PC versions of Windows. However, there was one other thing I wanted to demonstrate. My very first video as a retro computing YouTuber was compiling Hello World and other test applications for Windows 1.0. As it so happens, I still had those binaries saved, so obviously I needed to test them. It's probably unsurprising that they do in fact work on the Z100 version of Windows. This was intentional since Windows was essentially meant as a cross-platform graphics library in its early days and intended to help bridge the gaps between DOS-compatible and PC-compatible machines. This feature really didn't pan out, but we can see what Microsoft was intending here. There isn't too much more I have to say on the Z100, but as the night wore on, I used the opportunity to explore one other machine more in depth, and it's one that I hope to make a dedicated video on someday. It's an at and Unix PC which was the machine that broke the Bell system. The short story is that AT&T gave up their monopoly of the phone system to enter the computer market and failed miserably. The AT&T Unix PC thus was their only attempt to directly commercialize Unix. This specific Unix PC has a DAWs add-in card, which theoretically would have let AT&T harness a large number of pre-existing DAWs applications while having all the advantages of Unix. The only real problem with that idea is that it's complete and utter garbage. In practice, it only emulates a monochrome graphics adapter and a lot of programs just seem to die. I was able to run PC Rogue successfully, and yes, I'm aware of the irony of doing this on a Unix PC, but pretty much everything else failed. Even running Norton Sysinfo not only crashed, it sometimes took the DAWs execution environment with it. It's a really unimpressive showing to say the least. That being said, the Unix PC itself is a fairly fascinating beast. It has its own non-X based UI known as Manager, and it's much more user friendly than the typical workstation of the era. Graphics aside, it's still underpinned by System 5 Unix, which, once I dropped to a command line, was plainly evident once I brought out Vi and compiled Hello World. Honestly, I really wish I had a few days with this machine, as its historical significance is almost entirely forgotten. That being said, I ended up recording well past my bedtime, and well, I think this clip speaks for itself. It's just me. <laughs> Obviously, I need some sleep.
I won't pretend that I got anywhere near enough sleep, and I probably was a bit loopy on the last day, but it doesn't mean that I couldn't check out some other systems. One system in particular that caught my attention was this HP mini computer. It's an HP 3000 Micro XT, and it's the type of thing I love to see at VCF. I've personally been fascinated by mini computers and mainframe systems for years, and there's virtually no content on them on YouTube, so even being able to use one briefly is nice, especially with this glorious terminal. While I didn't have a lot of time to experiment with this system, from what I saw, the HP 3000 takes a lot of influence from mainframe systems, but it does feel more tailored to interactive sessions. This is easily seen with the extensive built-in help and interactive programming tools. As with essentially any system from this era, BASIC was available and I saw Fortran, COBOL, APL, and many other programming environments available. Of course, there were a few games, Fans of Zork might be interested in seeing its progenitor, Dungeon, and well, let's just say that there were plenty of time-wasting distractions available. All of these were text-based, although that might be because I was on a text-only terminal display. Beyond that, one thing that was rather impressive to watch was the tape device loading and spinning up. Magnetic tape storage like this was, as far as I understood it, essentially the replacement to punch cards, and even early versions of Unix expected to load from tape storage. Unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of time to record this system, and information in general is a bit hard to find, but given the opportunity, I would definitely do a much deeper dive for a follow-up video. This brings me to another system that I can at least write a bit more about. During the first day, I had spotted one machine that I had known about for a while, but up until this point, I had never had a chance to interact with personally, and that was the DEC Rainbow. This is what's known as a DAWs compatible computer in such that it runs MS-DAWs, but it isn't a PC. In effect, it isn't that dissimilar to the Z100 we looked at earlier. Frustratingly, there wasn't much on the hard drive, which isn't great when you're trying to demonstrate how a system works. However, we can see some of the differences from a normal PC in just comparing how the screen scrolls. However, what made this machine unique was its special version of CPM, which I tried to demonstrate by writing a boot disk. Unfortunately, the floppy disk drives on this machine were dead, and since we're on the topic, I will say that this is probably the weirdest floppy load mechanism that I have ever seen. Drive A simply errored out while Drive B would try to run for a while and then fail. Unfortunately, I couldn't get in contact with the owner of the machine to get permission to open it up and try and fix the drives. As such, I thought I was going to have to cut this segment for lack of content. However, as it so happened, there was a second deck rainbow in the front hall which I had initially overlooked and thus I could demonstrate its unique superpower. Welcome to CPM 8680. While CPM was available for multiple processor architectures, there was no software compatibility between the 8-bit and 16-bit versions. CPM 8680, which was unique to this machine, was the exception to this rule. With both an Intel 8088 and a Zilog Z80 processor internally, the DEC Rainbow was capable of running almost all commercial CPM software seamlessly. Let's take a moment to demonstrate. CPM80 software uses the COM extension, so I can load up the 8-bit version of Adventure from 1979 without issue. As we can see here, it has absolutely no problems. Returning to the command prompt, we can now load up a 16-bit program, which is denoted with the CMD extension. This is Infocom's Planetfall, and once again, it works perfectly. Data files could be shared between CPM80 and CPM86 applications, which made this the ideal transition machine. While there were other dual-mode machines, such as the aforementioned Z100, none of them, to my knowledge, were capable of this level of integration. I do want to cover CPM more in depth, so it's nice to be able to show this unique beast on film. Now, at this point, there are other machines that I could show and talk about, 
but honestly, I think this is a good cross section of what I experienced and a look at the weirder side of personal computing. It wasn't long after this that Cyrusil and I were loading up the car and I found myself sitting at my desk thinking on how to put this all into words. I suppose the real question I had to ask is, how do you share such an event? And well, I guess you saw my answer to that. I don't know if I really managed to convey the true experience of what these events are like, but even if I didn't, this single weekend let me pick up something that I've wanted for a long time. Meet the IBM RS 6000 43P that I found at consignment. It's a PowerPC machine that runs AIX. I actually had hoped it could also run the PowerPC version of Windows NT, but it's a bit too new for that. No matter, I'll have some fun with it. I haven't done much with it as of yet, but well, this machine represents what I want this channel to be, and that's the ongoing exploration and celebration of the weird and forgotten aspects of computing history. With all that said, if you want to support me on that journey, consider liking and subscribing. If you really want to support me, hit that bell or consider supporting me on Patreon. This is N Commander signing out and wishing you all a pleasant day.